appreciative of your uh, being here, and we trust that what has thus been said in the devotional will be something we'll realize is what we need every day of our lives to be able to persevere and be faithful to the Lord. We're in the process of studying Abraham, and we've been noticing as of last week lessons from Abraham's life. Now, I mentioned when we finished reading about the five different periods of Abraham's life <clears throat> that Moses records in Genesis that uh, he was a person who exemplified great faith. Mm -hmm. But there's something else stands out about him. I don't know why we don't see it, but I think you don't find a man of the faith of Abraham or any worthy, if you want to Hebrew, read Hebrews 11, you don't find those people being of that kind of obedient faith, taking God at his word, except that they also have patience. And so one of the great lessons to learn from Abraham is that he was a man of patience. Now, Ken's referred to some of this in his devotional a little bit ago. But I was thinking as he was speaking about how Abraham was a man of patience. And then uh, James, who mentions Abraham from the standpoint of his faith, points out concerning patience in James 5, as well as earlier in the book, as Ken noted. He says in chapter 5, verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. Now listen to this. For an example, an example of what, Jane? Suffering, affliction, and of patience. Then he says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Well, that's the point I want to make. And Job was a very faithful man, too. Patience is something we have to learn. Abraham had to learn it. I guess we could pose the question to all of us, wouldn't we like to know of his thinking, that is Abraham's thinking, during the first 10 years of waiting? and waiting, waiting for God to bring about the promise. We see a little bit of it in Sarah's suggestion that we studied when, for him to go ahead and have a child through Hagar. He must have learned something from that. But 25 years went by from the time that the promise was made to the time of the birth of Isaac. So there is a great, marvelous lesson in patience. Patience is the idea of enduring. Whether you feel good or feel bad, whether you suffer for it or whether you're blessed for it, we have to learn to endure. I think that can be added on to Ken's comments regarding the matter of suffering. Well, I'm sure we don't all know the reason God allows us to suffer on all of it. But I know that it's something you have to learn to deal with. You have to learn to live with certain things. And when it comes to Abraham, he knew God would perform those promises. But God would do it in his own good time. We must learn and practice endurance or patience. Often, we're troubled because we're in a hurry when God's not. And I think you can see that in the life of Abraham. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5 along these lines. He speaks of himself and the brethren of Galatia, which would cover all of us, all Christians of all time. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, wait. 
for the hope of righteousness. Then there is in Romans 8 and verse 25, but if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience, that's that bearing up under whatever is upon us, pleasant or not, being steadfast, in other words, wait for it. Again, Romans 8, 25. A good thought, keep in mind, is that the Lord may not come to do whatever it is you prayed for him to do, fully believing that when you prayed a righteous prayer, he would answer it. But he will always be on time. Now you think about that. So he was a man of patience. And life in the flesh on earth, if you're going to serve God and all that service means, obedience to his will, a faith that saves is a faith that obeys, Hebrews 5, 9. Then we are recognized that he will keep his promises, but it will be as he sees fit at the time. And he knows what's best and what time to do whatever he does. We move from Abraham being a man of patience and having had to learn patience, as we all must do, as we live the Christian life. But he was a man of peace also. It's recorded, and you remember this, we went through the text on the matter, that Abraham said a lot because their herdsmen were striving for one another, there wasn't enough land for all the flocks each one had. He says, let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. And, of course, he says, for we be brethren. Genesis 13, verse 8. I don't think in my lifetime, if I remember what I think I remember, that any time there's been strife between brethren, me or anybody else, I've never been happy about it. Never been happy about it at all. And Abraham, of course, here was willing to do even more than his part in order to have peace. That's an important matter. And likewise, of course, in learning lessons from the Old Testament that impacts us who are Christians of the new and the Lord's church is that we're to seek peace. Now, to be peace as the Bible sets out peace. We're to cherish peace, not peace at any price, but peace is the Bible that's out the peace it says that we are to cherish. And we're to pursue that peace. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33 that God is a God of peace. And we refer to Jesus and we know that he's called the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 7. That was said in prophecy. I believe it's 9, 6. That was said in a prophecy by the great Messianic prophet. And then Paul, writing to the church at Rome, said that the gospel, remember that's God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16, that the church is commissioned to preach to every creature, Mark 16, 15, is a message of peace. So men must strive to be at peace. First of all, they must strive to be at peace with himself through just the study of the Bible, and that's sufficient, but then now through experience and dealing with people for so many years. Most people who are normal, ordinary people, barring something that is far beyond their control, are not at peace with themselves because they haven't learned how to have that kind of peace. And yet this is something that is enjoined upon us. Paul said that to the brethren in Philippi. In chapter 4, verse number 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, 
shall keep your hearts and mind, hearts and mind, notice, through Christ Jesus. Well, of course, if uh, you're an atheist evolutionist, you don't believe there is a mind. You think all that's working is a fleshly brain. But God who put us together says we have a mind. And it continues to work quite well. You'll remember Abraham in the Hadean world told the rich man, son, remember. So he didn't have a brain there, but he had a mind. And he could remember. And one of the things that we need to always keep in our minds is that we're to strive to be at peace among ourselves. But always remember this, it's not a peace at any price. We're taught in Romans 14, 19 to be at peace with our neighbors as much as we can be. And of course, the beginning point of it all is to be at peace with God, Romans 5, 1, and a number of verses following verse 1 in Romans 5. If you look at the scriptures further, if we want to be acceptable to God, if heaven is to be our home, then we don't have any choice because God demands peace among brethren. But we know it's not a peace of any price. Just a cursory reading of the New Testament says God doesn't, doesn't want you to have peace at any price. Uh, compromise is not the answer on obligatory matters. Abraham knew better than to try to compromise what God commanded him to do. He just set about to do it. So we have peace with God because we obey him. That's all there is to it. Great many people are miserable because they know what the Bible says. They know they're that it's applicable to their lives. But the other thing they know is they're not doing it. And thus they're miserable. Yet we find in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, to the church at Ephesus, he gives out God's platform for unity. In other words, to have peace or to have unity, you must have peace with God. If you're to have peace among yourselves, you must have peace with God. And it's all on his terms. Notice how Paul starts that chapter. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And he tells us about God's platform for unity in each plank in that platform. There's one body, one spirit, even as you're called, one hope for your calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Well, what is that saying? Here's the way to have peace with God, with yourself, and with one another. And it involves the faith of Abraham. It involves a determination that says, let come what may and going to obey Christ. Yes, but that's going to get you nailed to a cross. I'm going to obey Christ. Yes, but your family won't like you. I'm going to obey Christ. Now, why would you be so stubborn with the truth of the Bible on that point? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Now, why should I let anything of this world, pain, anguish, happiness, wealth, lack of it, whatever, why should I let anything of this present world, including my own likes and dislikes, Cause me to not do God's will. You have the same kind of idea set out. First Corinthians 1 10, as far as unity, Jesus prayed for that unity in John 17, 20, and 21, and so on through you find that. 
So that's the reason I say it's not a peace by compromise. Our peace with God is where we completely yield to his will. And that's the reason a great many people are miserable. They know what God's commanding them. They also know they're not doing it. They know they ought to. They know they're not doing it. And so they're miserable. So if we would be what we know we ought to be, as the Bible teaches, then we will be a people of patience and we will be people of peace, peace brought about on God's turn. Well, leaving that, Abraham was also a man who recognized his responsibilities as a father. There's a lot being said today about, in fact, I heard some just this afternoon was on the news about how uh, men have been made out to be something other than masculine, that they've been feminized, made out to be whatever, but usually bumblers, and they don't know how to come in out of the rain, whatever else. And that's a sad situation. But the one reason that's that way is because we lost sight of marriage and home a long time ago in general America. People turned against God. They turned against his will. They turned against his will concerning marriage and home. And thus, they destroy the very unit that is designed to teach a little boy how to grow into a man, what his duties are, in the same regarding a little girl growing into a woman and what her duties are why God put them here in the first place, what God expects of them as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother. Uh, therefore, to begin to talk about how that mother and daddy ought to be examples to their children is something a lot of people don't know. The only example they have is everything but what the Bible teaches and mom and daddy. So many single parents, especially women, trying to raise kids. So much of it being done, there's been no marriage to begin with. So it's obvious that Abraham was a, a good example before his children. And so we come to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19. And here's where God pays a compliment to Abraham. Now, you think about that for a minute. We said toward the end of last week's class how that uh, we don't have to stand in shame. A certain class of people do not have to stand in shame before God. You can be a friend of God, have him in an enemy of him by sin. You can be reconciled to God. You can be justified in his sight. Well, it's interesting that when you read this passage, God says this of Abraham, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Now, why all of this? Well, listen to this. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now, we talk about providence. God, being omniscient, knowing all that's the object of knowledge, thus he knew Abraham. He the caliber person he was, just like he knew Pharaoh, the caliber person he was down in Egypt, so God could use him. But now here, Abraham is a marvelous character. See, another reason why God called him the father of the faithful. But think about what that's saying to every father. And yet today, the head of the house is basically a joke. You get yourself in big trouble to say the husband is the head of the house. The husband, all things being scripturally equal, is to have the final say so in that house. He rules, of course, out of love. If he's what the Bible says he ought to be, he loves his wife, even his Christ loved the church, and gave himself for it. He considers her as the weaker vessel and understands 
the assignment God's given her as a woman and a wife and a mother. So we're not talking about some sort of dictator like Hitler. We're talking somebody who, first of all, is responsible to God, knows it, and is obedient to God, and therefore seeks to perform the role God gave him by obeying the things a man ought to be, and do the things a man ought to do. Well, you don't see that today. He's made light of. Where is the man that rules as Abraham did his house? I'll ask that again. Where is the man today that, like Father Abraham, rules his house? We don't even like the word rule his house to describe a husband and father's relationship to his home. We don't like it. And we don't realize just how much politically correct terminology and attitude rubbed off on us, even while we complain about it. And yet that's what God's word says. Inspired Moses wrote it. And that's what God said about him. God pays this man a compliment. And he was what he ought to be as a father. Well, then may God help all of us recognize, especially those who are rearing their children now, the great responsibilities that they have as parents. May God help fathers to be the kind of fathers that Abraham was, that we ought to be, the right kind of example, to rear our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, train up a child the way he should go, and so on with all the other passages that teach us the particulars of being godly fathers. And we'll add on to that, godly mothers. But I ask you in leaving that point about Abraham, just realize how far we have fallen, yes, even in the church, in the family. In many cases, how far we've fallen from being the kind of people in service to God as husbands and wives, fathers and mothers that Abraham was in discharging his duty as a father. Another point that we want to keep in mind is that in Abraham, we get a beautiful lesson regarding the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we see that when God commands Abraham to offer up Isaac as a burnt offering. I said back when we went through the text that we might bring back up some things that we discussed while we're going through the text, now going through these lessons. And this is one of them I think I've already alluded to. Because if Abraham was 125 years old, and Isaac was 25 years old at the time that God told Abraham to offer him a burnt offering. Then I'll emphasize again what I did then. It's quite evident that Isaac willingly submitting to the plans of his father. And this fact tells us much with regard to the faith of Isaac at 25 years old. Well, as we see that, what about the death of Christ? God the Father gave his son, and the son lovingly, willingly gave himself. It's amazing to me, those Old Testament typologies, how much they teach us when you see in the New Testament what they typified, the reality of it coming out. There it was. So we have that marvelous lesson in the death of Christ and the love of the Father, yet to give his son, the willingness of the son to do what he came, or what he, what he was meant to do. And in this case, it was submission. But what was one of the main things 
that uh, he did. He submitted. Well, I see that our time has slipped by. And uh, before we go, I want to have a word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we're thankful we could study the Bible this evening together in the midst of this busy week. We're thankful that we can have thy word. And we're thankful thou hast communicated with us where we can understand it if we want to. Give us the love that we should have to obey thee. Put these things into practice to teach them to others, to defend the faith, to carry out our lives in accordance with thy will, with great faith as it's derived from thy word. We ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.